You know, it's interesting in this day and age, there's no doubt that people are feeling stress in their environment, whether it be the workplace, home, and other arenas of their life. Stress is increasing at a phenomenal level, and it has probably since about the uh, late 1970s, but that's another story. But however, you all know that in the last couple of years in particular, people have often said to each other, what on earth is happening on the planet right now? It seems like the world is going crazy. So what people are really asking is, well, how can I find happiness? How can I find contentment in this day and age? And that's what we're going to explore now. And I hope you're ready for the ride and for the journey. But let's get some definitions right. Happiness is a state of mind of feeling, such as contentment, satisfaction, or joy. So it's a state of mind of, of feeling. It's, it's contentment is probably the kind of word that we'd want to use here because happiness is not something that we can always get to, but contentment in life, feeling comfortable about where you are and what's happening around you is really what it's about. Someone else once said, it's more akin to something where you have the ability to feel fulfilled and able to cope with the challenges of life. It's not just pleasurable experiences like a nice dinner, but something that adds an extra dimension and meaning. Now, if you look at that quote, what is the standout phrase for you? And it's really about the ability to cope, the ability to feel fulfilled and to cope with the challenges of life. So we're not talking about the nice dinner or a great holiday, it's something more than that. It's at a deeper level that, than that, and I think that phrase, ability to feel fulfilled and able to cope with the challenges of life, is really what this seminar, this workshop, this presentation is all about. I hope you're up for the journey, as I said before. But let's look at what the reality might be. The reality is that fewer than one quarter of adults, one quarter of adults between the ages of 25 and 74, fit the criteria of flourishing in life, which is defined as a state in which an individual feels positive emotion towards life and is functioning well psychologically and socially. Now that, folks, is a sobering figure. Fewer than one quarter of adults between those ages fit the criteria. So there, I guess what the researchers are saying, and in this case it's Dr. Daniel Brown from Harvard Medical School, is that not everyone knows about how to implement contentment and the sense of feeling comfortable in their own life. Not everyone is feeling that they can access this. In fact, it's fewer than one quarter of adults. Someone once said, most men live lives of quiet desperation. Again, somewhat sobering. And further, most people live in survival, not fulfillment. So, according to those individuals, we all have a lot to learn. Because it is about making the most of our journey on this planet. But not all the journey is good news. You might know the cartoon character, Hagar. And Hagar is climbing up the mountain looking for good news. And he says, what is the key to happiness? And the learned monk says, abstinence, poverty, fasting, and celibacy. To which Hagar replies, is there someone else up there I could talk to? And yes, you might want to ask, is there someone else who's got another perspective on this happiness thing other than the one that I'm presenting? Because it's not all good news. The first qualifier is, it's a journey. So you never quite arrive at this so-called happiness thing or this pie in the sky thing that we're aiming for, this rainbow, that's out there, there is not the pot of gold. Instead, what we're looking for is that contentment and we're looking for that sense of fulfillment and purpose in life. 
And that's an ongoing journey. So I think there are probably four main building blocks that we have as we look for how to get happiness, how to get more particularly contentment, how to get that sense of feeling as though you're thriving rather than just surviving. So what are those four main blocks? Well, in the first instance, we have what we need to do physically as individuals, what we need to do in terms of our mind or headset, what we need to do in terms of our communication and our relationships, and finally, down the bottom here, what we need to do in terms of our purpose in life. So let's take each of those four main areas one at a time. The first one is about how do we get energy for living? I mean, you know as well as I do, if you have a cold or you've got the flu, you just don't have the energy for life. It's a drag to try and pull yourself through the day. It's difficult to get up in the morning. It's difficult to manage yourself and, and to be tolerant and have patience with other people because you're just down on energy, tired and feeling somewhat exhausted. So it is about having energy. So how do we get that energy? Well, we get it through a number of ways. And the research shows quite clearly that in the first instance, it's about diet and food. It's about what you put into your body that's appropriate to give you the energy you want. Now, there's a lot of research out there on each of these areas, and I'm not going to prolong the discussion on each of these because you know them already. Diet and food, the next one is really about fitness. And all of us probably know in what ways we could be fitter or in what ways we need to be fitter. The next one is sleep, because we should be getting at least eight hours. I know there are a few people that can survive on less than that, four or five or six hours, but most of us need appropriate sleep. And the research shows that if you don't get that sleep, it's almost like you're an alcoholic in that you are in a drunken state when you don't have enough sleep. So the, um, the behavioral symptoms are very similar. Lack of sleep, excessive alcohol, produces similar symptoms. So it is really important that we have enough sleep in our day and, our, and for our night. Relaxation is important. It's important to have time out. We can't be full on all the time and that's one of the big factors that I coach leaders on. When do they get their time out? Because being fully on all of the time is a recipe for burnout. Meditation, prayer, that reflection time is really critical. When do you have still time? <clears throat> when do you take personal time out to stop and prop? Believe it or not, parent training is really important. Being an effective parent and knowing how to parent effectively certainly reduces stress. And certainly, if you've got an effective parenting program and mother and father are both on the same page for this, then it really does assist your general energy for the day and doesn't drain you unnecessarily. So as I said, I'm not going to prolong the discussion on any of those aspects. You, you know them for yourselves. In fact, if I stop right now and I got each of you to turn to your neighbour and I said, talk to your neighbour about which one of these you think you're lacking in and talk to your neighbour for a, a couple of minutes on what you think you need to do on each of those, you would know right now. You know inherently within yourself what you need to do to have energy for your day. So having said that, you owe it to yourselves to make sure you do that for yourself because if you haven't got energy for your day, then really you're starting well behind the eight ball. So what's this next major area? The next major area is mindset. In this area, it's fascinating to look at the research. And what we see is that simply writing out a gratitude list, what are you grateful for? What are you thankful for? In fact, some of the people I coach and some of the leaders 
have a list of things and it's 10 things that they are grateful for. And they may be things that are quite straightforward, like I'm grateful for a roof over my head. I'm grateful for food on the table. I'm grateful for a family. I'm grateful that I live in this wonderful city. I'm grateful that I live in a free country. Whatever it might be, it's about what are you grateful for? And many of these leaders actually pick up that list as soon as they wake up in the morning and they read that list because it helps to keep them in a positive frame. That kind of allows them to keep in a positive mindset because immediately they recognise they're not taking things for granted. So it's very effective to, to have a gratitude list. The research also says that something like random acts of kindness are really important. Kindness in and of itself is an important human characteristic. But random acts of kindness are, um, are very important because they are random. People are not expecting them and in a sense you may not expecting it easy. Uh, let me start that again. People are not expecting them and you may not be expecting to deliver them either. For example, the individual who comes out of the car park and decides to pay for the person behind them, that is a random act of kindness. It doesn't have to be a stranger, it could be a family member. But those random acts of kindness are a, a great assistance to us as individuals to feel good about our life and feel good about ourselves. So that helps to get you in a positive frame of mind. I like the sayings that says, as you think, so shall you be. As you think, so shall you be. And be careful what you think, because your thoughts run your life. Proverbs 4.23. So thinking is critically important in terms of being cup half empty or cup half full. And I like the verse that says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Now that's from the message translation of the Bible, but it is again a prompt to us to really understand that thinking is transformational. That you are in control of your thinking. Well, I hope you are. If you're not, we've got some issues. But thinking is really critical to who you are. And you are con in control of your thinking. And that determines you from the inside out. And Romans 12 points us to that quite clearly. More particularly, everything begins with a thought. Once you really understand what you think about is what expands, you need to start to be careful what you think about. In fact, Professor Martin Seligman, who's well known in the psychological literature, says at least that there are at least 20 studies that show that optimistic people live eight to nine years longer than negative people. Strong research base shows in this instance that positive thinking actually assists longevity of life. If that's not a reason to start to think positive, then I don't know what is, but it's only one reason. Someone else once said, success doesn't come from the way you think it does, it comes from the way you think. Putting that another way, the philosopher once said, man is disturbed not by events, but by the view he takes of them. Are you getting the picture? I think Stephen Covey said it even better, and in uh, current language, it isn't what happens to us that affects our behaviour, it's our interpretation of what happens to us that affects our behaviour. And the key word there is interpretation. So it isn't the event necessarily that's the problem, it's how we perceive it. It's how we decipher it. It's how we interpret that event that then affects our behaviour. Critical point to understand. Again, I'm emphasising mindset. 
I'm emphasize, uh, emphasizing the way that your mind transforms who you are. Let me give you an example of that. I want you to look closely at the screen now. It's blank right now. But I want you to tell me what you see here. What is your, what is your interpretation? What do you see? Who sees an old woman? Who sees a young woman? And who can see both? Indeed, it does depend on your interpretation, in a sense. It's the same picture, but it depends on your interpretation. Maybe it's a young woman, maybe it's an old woman, maybe it's both. But it's your perception that counts here. Let me ask you, so how do you turn your thoughts around? How do you reverse your negative thoughts? How do you counter your negative thinking? And how do you get things in, into perspective? Because if in fact you can do all of that and change your thoughts around, then you're really on the way to getting a positive framework for your life. You're really on the way to looking at how you can be more content in life and how you can cope with the challenges of life if you're a master of your own thinking and can get on top of that thinking and give it a proper perspective or a more accurate perspective rather than engaging in faulty thinking. Let me tell you something further on that. Let me give you the model for how to change that around. This is called the ABC, D model. So what we have in the first instance is we have something that sets you off. There's a trigger, there's an event or a situation. It might be what someone says. It might be what someone does. It might be something you see, something you hear, something you're aware of. But there is something that sets you off. And as soon as it sets you off, and sometimes, by the way, that could be an internal trigger. You could be driving along and you're thinking about the argument you had with a family member. You could think, be thinking about that bully you're going to encounter at work. You could be thinking about that neighbour who's giving you grief. So it may not be the actual event, but it may, might be you thinking about that event because that then triggers some thoughts and self-talk. And that self-talk can go from a molehill to a mountain in a split second because your thoughts race away with you and spiral up, or perhaps spiral down, to, to make you feel badly. Because that's the next step, is C. On the basis of this thinking, you feel something. I mean, if you think happy thoughts, you're going to feel happy. It's not rocket science. If you think sad thoughts, chances are you're going to feel sad. If you think angry thoughts, chances are you're going to be feeling angry. So understand that your thoughts trigger emotions. And on the basis of that thinking, and on the basis of those emotions, you are then going to act and react and behave in a particular way. Now once you know that's what happens in your life, Chances are you may not be able to control all of the things that happen over here. I certainly can't in my life. I, I can try to, but chances are that I can't control everything that happens in my life. So I understand that there is stuff that's going to happen. But what I can control is what I think about this stuff, which then controls the feelings, which then controls my behaviour. So. If in fact I can get a grip of those thoughts and get them into perspective, chances are that I'll be in a good position to handle whatever life throws at me. Now I know that's, I'm covering that in a rather glib way and a rather um, fast track way and, and I accept that I've only just kind of moved through that fairly quickly. I mean I can spend a day on that in terms of a workshop um, and have done. But look, that is in a book, I don't want to leave you high and dry, but that is in an audio and a book to help you with your thinking. If any of you feel as though you're cup half empty, uh, cup half full, then feel free to access that particular book. And if you need to get hold of it, I do have copies, but it's certainly on Amazon. I just don't want to let you feel as though I'm leaving you high and dry and not giving you a recipe or a formula 
for how to move out of a negative state. All right, so that's your framework in your head. That's your negative thinking and how to make it positive, how to turn things around. Because that's absolutely critical if you want to live a life of contentment and be able to cope with the challenges that come along. And actually, this is the sort of thing they ought to be teaching people in school because we don't always get it in our families, believe it or not. Uh, often uh, people used to come into me and still do and they say, you know what, I'm a worry wart just like my mother or just like my father. So people learn their thinking style often through their caregivers and their parents and those who have raised them. So it's a learned behaviour, folks. It's not something you're born with. I've never seen a baby born with an inferiority complex. I've never seen a baby born who thinks negatively. No, we learn that stuff. And so the good news is we can unlearn it. So let's move on to the, the next area. Third area is communication and relationships. I think uh, one of the forefathers of psychology had some really interesting things to say when he said the greatest need of every human being is the need for appreciation. And more particularly, I think the way we represent that appreciation is in our communication. Martin Seligman again has written a book called Flourish and in that book he actually undertook a study of some of his uh, researchers with him and students and in this case they looked at 60 companies. A third were flourishing economically, a third were doing okay and a third were failing. So third, third, third. Flourishing, doing okay, failing economically or financially. They went into the company, recorded and transcribed every word that was said in their business meetings. That's a lot of transcript, I can tell you. Then each sentence was coded for positive or negative words, which provides a simple ratio of positive to negative statements. They actually called that the Lasada ratio because one of the researchers was called Lasada. So they looked at these companies and wanted to know, is the communication in the company a feature or determinant of how well the company is doing economically. Is there a connection here? Interestingly enough, what they found was this, that flourishing companies, it was about three to one for positive versus negative statements. Below that ratio, less than three to one, companies were not doing well economically. Positive communication in the company counts. It's called positive culture. Important not to go overboard though because life is like a ship with sails and rudder. Above 13 to one, in other words, 13 positive comments to one negative, means that the, sh the ship is really flapping aimlessly without a negative rudder, the positive ship the sails flap aimlessly and you lose your credibility. So you can't go overboard with the positive comments. But interestingly, it was in fact three to one. So how do you think it is in marriage? What would be your guess? What do you think the ratio is in marriage? In business, it's three to one. What do you think it is in terms of relationships? Well, let me tell you, if it was three to one, it means you're headed for divorce. So what do you think it might be in terms of your own relationship with your partner or even in your family if you're not in a permanent relationship or marital relationship. What do you think it might be? One to three clearly is a mitigated disaster. One positive comment to three negatives. But in marriage it's five to one and the research is clear on that. So what does that mean for your relationship? What does that mean for how you connect with your loved ones and those around you. Remember, it's five to one. And if you're really serious about contentment in life and being able to manage your relationships well, then it's not going out there and criticizing a partner or your family members or those close to you. It's about supporting them. And that means you have a strong and loving marriage or relationship. 
Because someone once said the quality of your life is determined by the quality of our relationships. And I think that says it succinctly and well. Let me tell you about an 80 year longitudinal study because I think this is fascinating. This is unprecedented in psychological research papers that we don't normally have longitudinal studies, studies over time. Normally they're taken at a, at a quick snapshot in time and there might be uh, at one point in time or it might be a couple of weeks or a month or so gap across the research. But to have 80 years is quite phenomenal. And the question was that they are endeavouring to answer is how do some people manage to struggle in life while others seem to be successful? I mean, isn't that a really fascinating question? I mean, that's a question probably you've asked as well. So what are the crucial factors here for a good life? The research was critical in this regard. It was undertaken through Harvard. It was the Harvard study of adult development and it was across 80 years. And doc, Dr. Robert Waldinger, is the clinical professor of psychiatry. He's the current one at Harvard Medical School and he is the fourth director of this project. Because it's been 80 years, they've had to have a series of directors who have been in charge of this project. But it started in 1938 and there were two groups of boys from the Boston area. Group one was 10th grade from Harvard College. Group two were boys from poor tenement housing with no hot or cold running water. So you've got two groups of boys, very privileged and those from disadvantaged backgrounds. The study began, began with 724 males, 60 are still alive and in their 90s. Some have developed addictions like alcohol, mental health issues like schizophrenia, others have climbed the social ladder and one was a president. How is it that some were entirely successful and others struggled in life. Well, it was about healthy connections in the first instance. In contrast, loneliness creates a toxic environment where people are less happy, health declines earlier in midlife, brain functioning deteriorates earlier, and those people also live shorter lives. So those who were connected in a healthy way got on better in life and succeeded in life than those who are isolated or lonely. But it's not just the connections we have, it's the quality of those connections. And the research showed that living in a connected, warm relationship is both positive and protective. On the other hand, living in the midst of conflict, such as in a poor marriage, is bad for our health and is actually worse than getting divorced. Overall, interestingly, and this is really fundamentally important, at age 50 years, the greatest predictor of health and satisfaction was those who are engaged in a positive relationship. Those most healthy in their 80s were those most satisfied in their relationship in their 50s. So longevity over time, at 50 years, it was the greatest predictor of satisfaction in life at 80, 30 years later, was the quality of that close relationship they had with someone. So, good positive relationships, not only protective of our bodies, but the research showed it's also protective of our brains. This is powerful research, and these findings are powerful. Having a secure and attached relationships where you can count on another person in times of need when the going gets tough, the other was there to support and care, which meant that our brain function in our 80s was significantly healthier. So positive relationships, positive communication, actually creates a healthy brain. That is significant research, and that is something that you and I need to know about. Those individuals who were in poor relationships had earlier memory decline. In other words, a satisfying and healthy life is about positive relationships with family, friends and community. So the third area is communication and relationships. Let's turn to the final area for contentment 
be able to handle the challenges in life and its purpose, direction, meaningfulness in life. Again, Martin Seligman in his book talks about this area and he says it's important that we have something called the meaningful life. The largest contributor, the largest contributor to human happiness is belonging to and serving something bigger than ourselves. Now for some people that might mean that they volunteer for the Red Cross. For some people that might mean that they give uh, time and money to their local organisation, charity. For some people that might mean helping at the soup kitchen for the homeless. For some people that might mean serving their God. Connecting with something external and using our higher strengths to serve something beyond our individual selves. So it has to be something beyond us. It has to be bigger than us. And as I said, it might be a charity or something similar, but for many people it is in fact serving their creator and serving their God. And the research shows quite clearly that people who have a faith are significantly more happy with their life, more satisfied with their life, more content with their life than those who don't have a faith. Now we don't know whether that's the faith itself or whether that's the community support and spirit that goes with attending at a church or having a group that meets together who are serving their Lord. Maybe it's both, maybe it's one or the other, but the research is clear that those who have a faith are significantly more satisfied in life. And it's interesting because there was this guy who walked the planet and his name was Jesus Christ. And so Christians believe that he is the son of God. Now, as a psychologist, if you get someone who's walking the planet and announces that he is the son of God, there are only two th conclusions you can come to. Either that person is psychotic and slightly deranged, or they are in fact the son of God. And that's a decision that all of us, in a sense, have to make in relation to this person. We can't sit on the fence in relation to who this person happens to be. If he is the son of God, we need to acknowledge that and honour that in a particular way. And if he's not, we can discount him. And I think C.S. Lewis said that quite clearly. He said, Jesus Christ, either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something else. But let us not come to any patronising nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. One of the really interesting books that I've read recently is this one by Greg Sheridan on God is Good For You. This was an amazing book. You, you can see I've gone through it fairly thoroughly with um, tags right through it. I thought this book gave a really good representation of the Christian faith, its difficulties currently, the fact that Christianity is falling out of favour and has for a good while now with the general community. But I think Greg Sheridan paints some really good um, perspectives on why God is good for you and that at the end he gives some hope for the future about where the planet is going and what Christians can do in this current climate and in this current society. So I recommend to you God is Good For You by Greg Sheridan who is in fact a, um, um, a writer for the Australian and I think has been for about the last 25 years. Well renowned a journalist. So the four areas, your energy, your mindset, your communication and relationships and your purpose. What gives you a meaningful life? Why are you here? What is it about? So those questions really then confront us. How well do we keep fit and healthy? How well do we keep a positive mindset? How well do we communicate and relate positively? 
and how effective have we been in finding our purpose and giving life meaning. If we all did the things that we're capable of doing, we would literally astound ourselves. And I think if we actually checked off on those four areas, then we would literally astound ourselves and find ourselves much more contented and living a life where we could handle more easily the challenges that life might present to us. George Burns once said, and his definition of happiness, you can imagine, he's got a particular twist in it, happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. Mother Teresa, however, in terms of her perspective on life, said, let no one ever come to you without leaving better and happier. Be the living expression of God's kindness, kindness in your face, kindness in your eyes, and kindness in in your smile. But let me leave you with this from Philippians 4 verse 11 to 13 in the New Testament I am not saying this because I am need for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, says St. Paul. And that captures the essence of contentment. No matter what your environment around you, there's that sense of contentment and satisfaction because life is being shared with you by the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your attention, thank you for your participation, and we welcome discussion as we move into the next segment.